Kevin Mullen. I'm the chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. And I'm going to ask all the board members to introduce themselves in just a minute. But I just wanted to make sure that everybody who wishes to speak has had a chance to sign in. And um, Abigail or Christina will bring me the sheets. And I'll call your name, but I'll also call the person's name who is on deck so that you can be ready. And what we're asking so that we can get a truly good public record of everyone's comments. If you could step up to that mic over here to my right, to your left, and, and speak into that when you're doing it. That way it'll be recorded for posterity purposes and uh, um, we'll make sure that uh, we get everybody's comments as part of the permanent record. So what we're all here today to talk about is two rate filings in the QHP plans, which is the exchange. And um, we know that this is not an easy year. Um, these are some pretty high rates, and I know that um, there are going to be some pretty, um, I shouldn't say heated opinions, but some very strong opinions. So um, just keep in mind that Vermont has a great record of doing everything very civil, and um, we're not the enemy. We're here to try to get to affordable rates in Vermont. So if you could just come up and really um, speak from your heart and tell us what you want us to know about uh, the QHP filings. And I think uh, if we do it respectfully, we'll, we'll have a great night and uh, hopefully we'll learn a lot from each other. So again, I'm gonna call Alicia Moyer to be the first speaker and on deck is gonna be Ethan Park. Yes, so Susan, if you could start. Hi, I'm Susan Barrett. I'm the Executive Director of the Green Mountain Care Board. Hi, I'm Tom Pelham. I'm a native of Arlington, Vermont. I now live in Berlin, and I've been on the board for about a year and a half. Hi, I'm Robin Lunge. Um, I'm also a board member. I've been on the board about three years, and I grew up in Brattleboro. I'm Jessica Holmes, and I've been on the board about five years, and I live in Middlebury. I'm Kevin Mullen. I grew up in Rutland. Uh, I'm Mike Barber. I'm the board's attorney. Uh, Maureen Yusufer, and I live in Colchester. Okay, Alicia. Welcome, and thank you for being first. <laughs> <laughs> Scary. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Alicia Moyer, and I meet with people daily as a certified healthcare navigator in. Uh, is the mic on? Mic on. I can't. You raise it up. Is there any way that we can get that louder? Hello. There we go. <laughs> I'll just have to speak right in. Hello. <laughs> Try that again. My name is Alicia Moyer, and yeah, thank you. I am getting taller. No. <laughs> I meet with people daily as a certified healthcare navigator. I'm certified through Vermont Health Connect. And I see a lot of people struggling to make ends meet. Um, I see people who have been on Medicaid for a period of time, and because um, they're, they've been working so hard or their job has improved, they get kicked <laughs> off Medicaid and then are in the position of selecting a plan. There's so many great plans to select, but often the premiums are high and the deductibles are very high. Um, I wanted to describe one of the most compelling examples, which is of a a couple who started a business a few years ago. Um, they have three children, and the business is doing so well that this year the children became ineligible for Dr. Dinosaur, and they were in the position of um, selecting a plan through Vermont Health Connect, through the exchange. Um, they selected the bronze plan, which is the least expensive, so they now have a $1,200 premium for a family of five, and um, they uh, as I spoke with them, they described just being in the position of choosing between their mortgage payment and their health care premium. So I just wanted to describe that as really the, you know, it's a hardworking family, successful business. They have, actually I met, should have mentioned, they have eight employees, including, including themselves. And they really take seriously putting their employees first, making sure they're paid. And um, I would just hate to see such high rate hikes for a family like that as an example. So I guess that'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. 
and I know that at some point I'm going to really badly butcher somebody's name. Please excuse me. <laughs> but uh, next is Ethan Park, and on deck is Jeanette Hogue, I hope. Welcome, Ethan. Thank you. I'm Ethan Park from Montpelier Citizen. Um, Consumer Reports lists the ACA health insurance costs in all 50 states for 2019 citing insurer rate filings and other sources. For comparison, the report just chose one plan, which is the lowest, or second lowest cost silver plan for a 40-year-old male who doesn't receive financial subsidies. And Vermont's example was an HMO plan with a $622 monthly premium, $1,550 annual deductible, out-of-pocket maximum 6650 total exposure, including premiums up to 14111 The increase for this example from 2018 was 23.2%, the highest increase in the U.S. in this Consumer Report comparison. Not only was Vermont the highest, but Vermont and North Dakota were by far the outliers. The other states were far below including Tennessee that decreased a hefty 26.2% from 2018. Now I understand that the Blue Cross and MVP filings are an average of uh, increases on a number of plans, um, but I have to wonder that Consumer Reports uh, chose this one plan as some kind of an indicator so that consumers could tell how affordable health insurance was in the various states. Another study by United Benefits Advisors found Vermont to have the fourth highest premiums in the U.S. for an individual in 2016. And although our average annual deductible was a little bit lower and somewhat offset these higher rates, we still ranked in the lower half of states um, in terms of affordability. Uh, in 2013, here in Vermont, we started spending the $45 million federal SIM grant. More federal money was poured into setting up the ACOs, and the advent of OneCare was heralded as something that would control costs and improve quality. Neither has occurred. We are now in year two of the all-payer model. Excuse me for my tremor. And um, I don't think very many people can understand what the all-payer model is, and I haven't heard a good explanation for it. We, the public just doesn't know what the heck it is. Um, I recently heard about a state employee who went to the Waterbury Urgent Care Clinic for an attached tick. The tick was easily removed, and uh, the employee was given uh, 200 milligrams of doxycycline. The charge was $1,300. Uh, in my view, the changes that the Care Board has ushered in with the ACO and so forth is only feeding the monster. The hospital expansion projects, the many new consultants, overpaid administrators and contractors, the new IT systems, one care. These changes have resulted in rapid consolidation and monopolization on the provider side, which has in turn led to less insurer bargaining power and higher charges. The Care Board should limit hospital prices to the consumer price index, as Rhode Island has done, or index hospital prices to Medicare, as proposed in North Carolina, or hold hospitals to a global budget, as Maryland has done. The Care Board should also examine why there are huge variations between hospitals and what commercial insurers pay for the exact same services. We are in danger of losing rural hospitals. We are losing primary care providers in some locations. Independent practices have all but vanished. There's been a decrease in primary care visits among Medicaid recipients in the ACO. There's been a noticeable deterioration in the quality of primary care as clinicians hurry patients in and out, stare at the computer, which is all about coding and billing, and practice to the so-called test. The reason for our high commercial insurance rates is not the aging population or the cost shift. These are red herrings that are easily debunked. I would like to leave you an article published yesterday in JAMA that pins the blame for high commercial rates on insurer secrecy and big hospital greed. We have a medical industrial complex that is out of control 
and will not restrain itself despite the rhetoric of accountability. The only restraints we have, rate review, CON, and hospital budget reviews are proving inadequate. The care board needs to get tough and creative. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Christina, could you, could you raise your hand? Um, over here, right behind Ethan, is Christina McLaughlin from our staff. And Ethan, um, the comments that you wanted to enter into the record, if you could give them to Christina, she'll make sure that they get properly entered. And if anybody else has any written comments they wish to have entered into the record, if you could likewise, after your uh, comments are made, give them to Christina, and we'll make sure that they're a permanent part of the record. So um, Jeanette Hogue and on deck, Christine Smith. And please make corrections where I butcher names. You did good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so my name is Jeanette Hogue, and I'm here on behalf of my partner. He has worked and paid taxes for over 50 years. He has COPD and emphysema from working in the gasoline industry, going inside gas tanks with toxic fumes wearing only a paper mask. Can you hear back here? I'm here. Let's see if that comes out. It's just slowly going back down again. partner has worked and paid taxes for over 50 years. He has COPD and emphysema from working in the gasoline industry going inside gas tanks with toxic fumes. Maybe if you could maybe face them, yeah. maybe turn the mic so that you could face them and then. Is this better? Yeah. Just pretend like you're Robin Williams in Good Morning Vietnam and yeah. belt it out. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, he has COPD and emphysema from working in the gasoline industry, going inside gas tanks with toxic fumes wearing only a paper mask, a job that now requires people to wear a mask and outside airlines. He gets $1,500 a month disability and Medicare, which only pays for 80% of his medical bills. Once he pays his monthly expenses, there is no money left over to pay for supplemental health insurance to cover that extra 20%, yet he does not qualify for Medicaid. He applied for financial assistance with his regular doctors and hospitals. When he checks in with the receptionist, she says, oh, you have Medicare and you're a welfare patient. Talk about being shamed for being disabled. While other medical providers do not offer financial assistance. Currently, he needs supplies for his oxygen machine and his CPAP machine, and he cannot get them because he has a pending bill for the company that supplies these items. He has to pick and choose which providers he can send $10 or $20 a month towards his balance. So the other providers send his bills to collection agencies. Vermont needs a universal health care system that fully meets the health care needs of all the people and is equality financed. Your system is not working. If you raise your rates, you will just hinder more people from accessing health insurance, and some, pe people, may e some people may even have to drop their coverage because they can't afford the premium. Thank you. Thank you. So up next is Christine Smith and then Elizabeth Clark. Hello again. Good to see you again. For the third time, ain't it? Yep. <laughs> the first time I was, hey, this ain't on. Put it right up. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. All right, Verizon's working. So as you can tell, half of the room is for, from Vermont Worker Center. Wonder why. We all want universal health care. We have been fighting for it 
It's done past. And what do we get? Blue Cross Blue Shield wants another 15% increase. Wow. Isn't that a miracle? What happens to the people that have to pay $1,500 a month just to get insurance, but where does that money go? Does it go to the insurance? Does it go to the doctors? Where does it go? I don't know. Maybe the CEO's pocket where it don't belong. For me, I still take care of my mother. My mother's got dementia. It's now moderate to severe. I have two brothers who don't give a care. I'm the youngest out of three. I do all the hard work at home. I have to change my mother. I have to make sure her food is done. I have to do her laundry. I have to clean house. Does anybody know what it's like? Anybody? Does anybody take care of their parents? Do you take care of your parents? I, I did. So you know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. Do you? They're both dead, but as they were dying, I did. And do you? My mother's also dead. But you took care of her. And it's very hard, is it not? Did you have family to help you with it? I'm an only child. So you know. I have two brothers, and God can strike me. They don't give a damn. I talked to one of them last night, and all he was worried about was him getting into an accident and not being here. It's very hard. Very hard. So all these increases that everybody wants in these insurance companies really don't need them. If you ask me, they all can go to hell. We're the richest country in, in the United States or whatever. And all the other countries have universal health care, but what? We don't? It's not fair. It's not fair. So something needs to be done, literally. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, next is Elizabeth Clark, and on deck is Graham from rural Vermont. And Graham, I'm not going to even attempt uh, to say your last name because I know I would butcher it, so I'm going to let you um, introduce yourself when it's your turn. So, Elizabeth? Hello, my name is Elizabeth Clark. I am a Green Mountain Care now, but before I was on Blue Cross Blue Shield from 94 until a few years ago, when I was working, I could afford to buy private insurance, but when I lost my job, I couldn't afford to pay for it anymore. Luckily, I qualified for Medicaid and that's what I am on now. Since I'm disabled, I couldn't work. If I didn't qualify, I would never be able to afford private insurance. I can't afford it now. I definitely wouldn't be able to afford private insurance. If it was another 15%, we have to live on Goodwill food for half of the month. As it is because we only get $194 in food stamps, and that only covers half of the month for us. Food is not cheap nowadays, so I'm here today to tell you that we need accessible health care for all people because none of us should have to go without. Thank you, Elizabeth. So next is Graham, and after that is Madeline Walker. And Graham, if you could just start by introducing yourself, and now then I'll know how to say your last name, too. <laughs> no, that's, that's fair enough. My name is Graham Unang Strufenacht. I'm a small farmer, and I work at a... I can spell that. <laughs> I've been doing this my whole life. Uh, it's U-N-A-N-G-S-T hyphen R-U-F. E-N-A-C-H-T. So I work at Rural Vermont, a local nonprofit that works on small farm advocacy, food sovereignty, etc. I'm also a small farm in the area. I grew up in East Montpelier, Vermont, live in Plainfield, Vermont. Uh, there's been a general call from farmers nationally and locally 
to advocate for them in healthcare processes. Um, we put out an issues survey last fall to over 200 people who filled out this survey. And surprisingly, they all ranked healthcare as the issue at the top of the list affecting them, their families, their farms, the issue they were most concerned about. A national survey put out by Hired and Ag in 2017, which Shoshana Inwood, formerly of UVM, um, particip um, was an architect, clearly showed that farmers want the USDA to advocate for them on behalf of their healthcare needs. Rural Vermont feels these proposed rate hikes and ongoing rate hikes to this degree on a yearly basis are unaffordable, excessive, and inequitable. Here are some of the uh, statistics from the 2017 Hired and Ag National Farmer, Rancher, Farmer and Rancher Survey. Health insurance is a national farm policy issue. Health insurance is tied to farm and ranch risk management, farm viability, and economic development. Over half of the households, which is 55% in the study, are not at all or slightly confident they could pay for the costs of a major illness or injury without going into debt. 22% of the farm households had a medical or dental debt of over $1,000. Over three-fourths, 79% of these households said health insurance was a risk management tool for their business. 72% want the USDA to represent them in national health insurance policy discussions, which I already mentioned. Almost half of farmers and ranchers, 45%, are concerned that they will have to sell some or all of their farm or ranch assets to address health-related costs, such as long-term care, nursing home, or in-home health assistance. Just over half of farmers and ranchers, 52%, are not confident they could pay the cost of a major illness, such as a heart attack, cancer, or loss of limb without going into debt. Farmers are particularly vulnerable to health care needs, given the average age is close to 60 years old. Their type of work is physically demanding. Uh, and if they have, are injured, they rarely have people who, can, who they can bring on. And there's no paid leave to cover them or their small businesses. The USGA general average national income projected for 2019 is negative $1,449. Negative $1,449. Vermont Farm to Plate, some numbers I thought was interesting from a 2015 report of theirs, that 79% of farms under 220 acres, almost 4,500 farms, got less than 25% of their household income from farming. 67% of farms over 260 acres, which is 893 farms, which is now dropped substantially, got greater than 25% of their household income from farming. What I think is notable about that is that the, the the marker here is 25% of your household income from your primary form of livelihood. The general trends in farm income and rural economic health need to be justly considered in your deliberations concerning the affordability and access of health care in Vermont. How will rate hikes affect farmers and those they connect with? We have water quality issues in Vermont right now, and in the Farm and Water Coalition and other groups. We know that environmental wellness is directly tied to farm viability, and we know that health care is directly related to farm viability. We know that farm viability itself is compromised. We know that mental health is a challenge on farms. Farmers are getting milk checks in the mail right now, and with many of those milk checks, they're getting suicide prevention notices. We know that this will result in worse health care outcomes if they can't afford health care. And we absolutely know that farmers cannot afford rate hikes, which have absolutely no corollary in their livelihood or field. In terms of the equability of these proposed rate hikes, <clears throat> I'll get back to them in a moment. <clears throat> the proposed rate hike will, without a doubt, affect the affordability of health care for many Vermonters who are currently struggling to afford the cost of their current health care. The effects of this will ripple out socially and economically and lead to worse physical and mental health outcomes throughout our communities. This morning, a representative of Blue Cross Blue Shield said that we are, quote unquote, on our way to a more sustainable health care system through this process. This is certainly not true for a public which, which is currently being asked to afford some of the most expensive health care globally with some of the poorest health care outcomes. We know that publicly funded universal health care is the only sustainable path forward and the only path which assures consumer protection and health care is a human right. 
This morning, the person from Blue Cross Blue Shield said that solvency for, this in for his industry and company is the most fundamental factor in consumer protection. He said that individual Vermonters may struggle to afford health care, but better to struggle than to lose access. And I think these comments really show how out of touch this is with most Vermonters' lives. I think that most Vermonters would feel relatively repulsed by these sentiments and understand that if we do, we do lose access when health care is not affordable. Affordability is access. He said that it's so expensive because they must, the, they must provide rates on a community versus individual basis in Vermont. And I think all of us here today know that our community members, all of them are struggling to afford their premiums, or almost all of them, their deductibles and insurance regardless of their age. He said that because there is, quote unquote, no penalty for not carrying health care in Vermont, they may lose people this coming year, and they're planning on that in their proposed rate hikes. We suggest that they will lose people not because they offer they will lose people because they offer unaffordable and inadequate coverage. Most fees suggested over time for not purchasing health care are less expensive than the excessive cost of health care itself. As Blue Cross Blue Shield has pointed out, there are many rising costs in the health care industry from pharmaceuticals to hospital executive salaries, which affect their rate projections. We recognize these factors and agree that they are problematic and absolutely must be addressed. And we feel it's unjust and inequitable to pass along the cost of these problems to the rate paying public when most of this industry, the healthcare industry and its players, enjoy profits and salaries well above that of most Vermonters. Lastly, we recommend that this board suspend the end date of this public comment period and conduct public hearings like this across the regions of Vermont outside of normal working hours. This hearing and process itself is relatively inaccessible to those who need to work regular hours or travel in order to have their voices heard in person. I will submit this testimony tomorrow, potentially slightly expanded. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Graham. So next up is Madeline Walker, and on deck is Pai Sai Larito, I believe. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right. My name is Madeline Walker. I am from the White River Junction area, and I just wanted to briefly share with you all what it's like to actually be someone with a chronic illness who's struggling with health insurance. I am 20 years old. I have been chronically ill since I was 18. I have an illness that displays itself in chronic pain, muscle weakness, and nausea. So this is something that affects my everyday life. Um, at the onset of this illness, I was seeing multiple doctors a week. I was having multiple surgeries, scans, procedures, and I slowly stopped because even with my health insurance, Blue Cross Blue Shield at the time, it was practically unaffordable. Now I am uninsured, looking, trying to get on a plan that is not only affordable for me, a 20-year-old with nothing but a high school education, and covers the treatments I need to function on a daily basis. And it's reached the point where it's a vicious cycle. I need certain treatments to go to work, and I need to work to afford those treatments. I think about healthcare and my health insurance every single day. It's not something I think about when I go to the doctor's office or when I have to pick up a prescription. This is something I carry with me every single day the ability to afford the care I need to function, to give back to my community, to engage with this beautiful state we live in. And I just, I need you to know that accessible and affordable care is care that someone doesn't have to wake up and wonder if today is the day that they go broke because they have to see their doctor. We need affordable and accessible health care in Vermont, and these rate hikes aren't it. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Um, before we go to the next person, I, I see Eric here. I'm not sure if Mike is here, but is Mike there with you? Yeah. Could, could you just stay? Could, perfect. Raise your hand, which is what I wanted. Uh, Madeline, if, if you could talk with... Mike in the back or Eric there, they might be able to help you to try to figure out um, how you might be able to get access to care. They're from the Vermont Healthcare Advocates Office and they work on a, on a daily basis trying to 
make sure that Vermonters have access to care. So, is somebody's car horn going off? <laughs> okay, so, um, and I, I'm sure I butchered this one completely. Paisai, Laratro, and then Kevin Wagner. Maybe it's pre C. I'm sure I butchered it badly. <laughs> Any ideas? Well, if I don't call your name by the end of this list, then um, please raise your hand and we'll make sure that. Uh, we hear you because we don't want anybody to uh, not have the opportunity. So next is Kevin Wagner and on deck will be Keith Batlick. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Wagner. I'm from Bradford, Vermont and I'm on MVP Healthcare. Um, I, I, I testified here last year, and I'm probably still paying down medical debt from doctor's visits I in in incurred around that time. I'm being treated for hypertension, and and it it it, def it definitely affects the am amount of care I'm able to seek out. That yeah, you know, like every time every time I go to the doctor, it's going to be yet more debt and. I've, 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 I've told this story before and every, everyone, a lot of people here have stories just like it and you know, I, ha I have to admit to feeling very frustrated that like <clears throat> we, keep we, we keep having to come tell these stories year after year, not, not, not just to this board but to le legislative committees and, uh, and, and, and other forums and we, we basically have to plead for our lives and uh, and you know, I'm, I'm trying to assume best intentions in all of your parts, um, but yeah, like the end, the end result is the same. That like people just shrug their shoulders and say, "Well, you know, okay, I, we, we'd like to help you, but I guess there's nothing we can do about it." But you know, it's like I, I, I've been paying attention to this issue long enough that I can remember when when, when Vermont Health Connect was presented as a temporary stepping stone on the path to true universal health care and. You know, no, and and no progress seems to be being made on that front. And and, and like a, a, every year, greater rate hikes get proposed, and you all and and, and end up approving may, may, maybe maybe a lesser number than was originally proposed. But you know, the the amount we're having to pay for care keeps going up, and I I, I certainly haven't gotten a. Ten, a 10% a, a pay increase over the past year, and and I'm sure most of the other people in this room haven't. And it's it, it's it's not fair. We need we, we, we need real solutions, and we we need them now. Thank you. Thank you. So next is Keith Batlick, and on deck is Ellen Schwartz, and Susan. If you could collect the next sheet from Abigail. Okay, I'd like to ask if I could switch with someone who has to leave and she'd really like to speak. Oh, well, absolutely. Okay, Rachel. And Rachel, what's your last name? My name is Rachel Nelson, and thank you for the special treatment today. Um, I can, my name is Rachel Nelson, and my husband and I live in Barrie, Vermont. We're some of the lucky ones with gainful employment who are doing well. Um, I'm going to cry. I may or may not have an anxiety attack. I may vomit. Uh, you see, some of you may have noticed I appear to be pregnant, and it's because last week I was. I'm struggling with morning sickness, and one of those things I don't tell you growing up with the idea of having children is that morning sickness doesn't go away when your baby dies. You get to keep that for a while. They also don't tell you 
that you will have to argue with your insurance company that you still deserved your medical care even though your baby died. This is something that makes me feel quite insane right about now because I have all the pregnancy hormones and the postpartum hormones and not a baby to hold and it's my third time in a year. And each time the doctor said it was a fluke. So they didn't run tests because the insurance doesn't want to pay for tests to find out why my babies keep dying as we enter the second trimester and things are supposed to be wonderful. And what, what our insurance does, we see we are on Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, is they cover pregnancies. You don't have to pay co-pays. There are certain fees along with the monthly amount that you have to pay unless your baby dies then it's not pregnancy, it's not prenatal care. Then you have to have a DNC, an abortion, to remove your dead baby from your body because your body is fighting to hang on to that baby. And it sucks. It super duper sucks. And your insurance says it wasn't a necessary procedure, except if you leave a dead baby inside of your body, you die. It was a necessary procedure that I had to argue with them for over a month, what felt like arguing for my soul a year ago in June. But doctors said it would be okay, so we did it again. We were supposed to have a little baby for Christmas, and it didn't happen. We were supposed to have a little baby this July, and it didn't happen. And we're supposed to have one in January, and it didn't happen. And you know what? Sometimes life sucks, and that happens. But I'd love for someone to explain to me why I have to argue with an insurance company and why instead of healing right now and lying in bed and trying to face this, which I haven't done yet, I haven't said these words out loud because I've been pregnant 42 weeks and I'm not gonna hold a baby. And now, now that I give up, they'll run the tests. Now the insurance is okay with that. I'm not. I don't know that I could ever do this again. But the doctors will, the insurance will. My babies, my older children are home sad. They were expecting a little brother in January and a little sister in July. And we don't even know about the first baby. I should never have to argue that I was pregnant. I should never have to argue that I deserve as much coverage and as low fees as a woman who gets to hold her baby at the end of this. That's not okay. No woman should have to argue these details out with an insurance company as her heart <laughs> sinks further into her chest. The last time, the woman at the hospital couldn't even take it. And she got tired of the arguments and she hated it herself and she decided to write off those charges that I felt like I shouldn't have to pay and I'm so glad for her but no other woman who doesn't have the strength to come in here to say this, no person should have to fight why their illness, why their problem, why their pain is not something that they should have to argue with somebody who also wishes that we just covered it. It's medical care. It's needed. You shouldn't have to argue that while your life is falling apart, why everything sucks. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. So Ellen Schwartz and then Erica Dodge. So it's, it's really hard to, um, I'm Ellen Schwartz from Brattleboro. It's really hard to speak after that, hearing that story, um, but I will. Um, my, I'm sharing this comment on behalf of my grandson, Nicholas Algren, who couldn't be here tonight because he's working. Um, Nick graduated from Keene State this spring, and in spite of earning a BA, he's currently working for $11 an hour. Up until now, he was on Dr. Dinosaur when he was a child, and then adult Medicaid, both of which provided him with the care that he needed. He's now um, reporting his new income to Medicaid, and he anticipates 
being informed that he no longer qualifies. He met with Alicia, or spoke with Alicia, the healthcare navigator, to learn about his options on Vermont Health Connect, and fortunately, he will, he will qualify for a subsidy. However, I was talking with him after I got home, when, um, from after he had this conversation. Um, my understanding is that the plan that he'll get will not include dental or vision, and will come with deductibles. So the combination of the premium, which is what we're talking about tonight, but for the person, there's also the deductibles and all the things that he's no longer qualifying for, like the vision and dental, that he has to save money to pay for out of pocket. For him, it's like all one expense. It's not just that those things aren't separated out. Um, and all of that is gonna be steep for a person who's earning, he's working full time, earning $11 an hour, and also needs to start payments on over $40,000 of student debt and keep a car running and insured so he can actually get to his job and earn that $11 an hour. The premium increases are just one element of a fragmented and dysfunctional healthcare system. It makes no sense that Nick and other people like him are worse off because they're working than they were as children or students who qualified for Medicaid. We should all have access to what Medicaid offers. It shouldn't be based on whether you qualify or whether you don't qualify. $11 an hour is a low wage, but at full time apparently it's too high for Medicaid, so he's actually in a worse position because he took this job. Denying the rate hike requests won't fix the broken system, but it will rein in the cost to people who are already on the edge financially. Because the system is so fragmented, the rate hike requests are divorced from the reality of people's lives where insurance premiums are just one of the costs of healthcare and one of the costs of living. Ultimately, what we need is one system for all of us so that people don't have to jump through hoops in order to get health care or deal with denials like we've heard about tonight or worry about what they're going to do if they are denied. That is the unfulfilled promise of Act 48. And I look forward to the day when we don't have to come to these hearings anymore because we have a truly universal system where Nick and thousands of other people in Vermont can rest easy knowing that we all have access to the health care that we need. Please deny these rate requests and do everything within your power to move us to a system that provides health care for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Next is Erica Dodge, and on deck is Keith Batlick. Hello, I came here today as a small business owner, a mother, and a wife. My husband and I recently chose to settle in Vermont. We're originally New Hampshire natives. Um, I am a self-employed architect, my husband a self-employed builder. We live in Morristown and we love our quality of life. Um, we're so lucky to have jobs and live in the beautiful mountains. The rising costs of living in Vermont are not reflected by the wages we make we are faced with daycare, um, health care, our mortgage. It's just the, the cost of living on the rise cannot be sustained here. Uh, we're faced with the difficult decision of did we make the right decision of living in Vermont? Um, we've lived in highly taxed states. We lived in Maine, California, and we ultimately chose here to settle. We're contemplating whether or not we, move, we need to move back to New Hampshire to live closer to family so they can assist with the cost of living. We're very fortunate people to have the support of family. <laughs> We're in a position where we could potentially provide good jobs to our community, but we're, we're not going to be able to do that if we can't afford to live here ourselves. So I hope that you consider young families like mine who are faced with these high healthcare costs my one-year-old daughter had a 105.5 fever three weeks ago. And on the back of my mind, I didn't want to take her to the emergency room because I didn't want to be faced with a multiple thousand dollar bill. I wasn't even sure how much it would be. And I shouldn't have to make those decisions. I should be able to provide my daughter with the best care 
possible and know that we'll be able to make our mortgage payment. So I ask you consider young business owners and families like myself. Thank you. Thank you. So next is Keith Batlick and on deck is Kelly Cummings. Hi, my name is Keith Batlick. I live in Sheffield. I've been at this for so long, like many people, um, as far as health care reform goes, this has been going on for quite a long time, over a decade or, and beyond. Um, every time it seems like we get close to some type of reform, which happened in 2011, the plug by 2014, the plug was pulled and here we are back again. Um, the more this happens, the worse it's going to get. It's, it's like a downward spiral is what this is. The more people can't afford it, the more are going to be dropped out of the system. It's going to get more expensive, and it's just going to get worse. And my question is, as far as people paying a good sum of money to, to be insured, and then they have to bargain or try to wheel and deal with the insurance company to, to get any, any type of coverage, I'd like to know, you're looking, you're supposedly, as far as accountability goes, these companies, you're overseeing what's going on, I'm, I'm sure, behind the scenes. But I'd like to know, how often does it happen where an insurance company, there's bonuses given out if you can deny somebody coverage? And another good question, what's the CEO making? I, bet, I mean, if there's incentives to deny people coverage, there's something's not right here. Uh, it, it, the bottom line, it, it seems to be the dollar. And uh, it, as long as, as this is going to keep going on, it's only going to get worse. This isn't sustainable. I, and I hate to see that we're going to be back here next year or in a couple of years, and it's only going to be worse. And, and I really hope you, hope you hold these companies accountable. And I don't know, do you get to look at their books or anything? Yes, we do. Okay. Is that still going on where they get incentives to deny people coverage? Bonuses? I, it's not incentives to deny coverage, no. Okay, because in the past, I know that's happened in other companies, but I'm just curious. It just seems like that happens. Anyway, I hope in a couple of years, people aren't back here again. And I hope you'll deny these ridiculous uh, increases. And thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. So next is Kelly Cummings, and on deck is Bill Coleman. I sure wish y'all had this stand working, because I've got to turn pages here, and I have a small prop. Um, but before I go into my little thing I wrote down, which I, I just want to I want to tell everybody who's here, thank you again for coming. I know you've been here before. I've been here before. We've been in this for a very long time. Thank you for telling your stories. They're important, and I'm sorry that you have them to tell. I'm very moved. I'm very moved. And for y'all, I hope, I don't know you. I don't know you. But I hope that this is more than just a job to you. I hope that you hear their stories. And I hope that you really listen because what they're saying is real and it's their lives. It's all our lives. And so I hope, I hope it's not just, okay, next, next, next. That's what I hope. Okay. I get really nervous at this and every time I continue to speak up because of these people, because this is important, um, but I'm doing it. So when I get shaky and a little goofy, just bear with me. I know you're with me here. So I've decided to take a little um, different track. Um, I'm going to start with this. So I've, I've got something to sell you. Um, and I've already got the uh, sales contract written up. Let's just pretend this is it. We got it right here. So on it, we've got a dollar sign. We've got a question mark and an X for your signature. So there's a... No need to read it first because there's nothing there to read. But I'm going to need your signatures before you see what you're paying for. So how many of you would uh, feel comfortable signing, signing this contract? I mean, 
Any, anybody? If you're a taker, let me know. Let me know right here. Raise your hand. Any? Okay. All right. So, so we don't we don't want to do that either. We don't want to do that. No, we do. We, you're exactly right. So I can't think of any other consumer transaction in America other than health insurance, where we legally commit ourselves to a purchase before we know what we're paying for, and how much it's going to cost us. We've heard all the talk about shopping around and comparing prices as if we're buying a TV. Um, that's a myth, and everyone in this room knows it's a myth. We also um, know why the insurance companies tell us they cannot provide a price list, because they've cut a million different deals with a million different hospitals and doctor's offices. They have intentionally created such a convoluted system for nothing more than to enhance their profits. And one example of this is surprise billing. We, <laughs> So, you know, it's where you go to a hospital that you know is in your network and perhaps to have surgery um, just to find out when your bill arrives, unbeknownst to you, you have interacted with all these doctors who are out of network and you're left on the hook because you signed remember that contract that is legally binding you're on the hook for it you, you signed so this is absolutely ludicrous it's ludicrous we don't do this with any other purchase in America at all no way I wouldn't buy a car and they go, here, just sign the contract, put it right here on the dotted line, and then we're going to tell you what you're going to get and how much it's going to cost. But when it comes to health care, that's it. That's our only option. That's what we have to do, all of us, from the, there's, if from the highest to the lowest. That's our option. It's crazy. It's crazy. So the, you know, the, the private free market um, works for many things. Right, we would agree, it works for a lot of things. But it is brutally obvious, it does not work when it comes to health care. It does not work. So we have, we have no more money to give. We have no more money to give. And I'm asking you, decline these rates. We don't have anything more to give. So please, as John Stewart so eloquently said, please do your job and protect Vermonters from the insatiable appetite of the insurance companies who have us on their hook. And we are tired of being dinner. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Next is Bill Coleman and on deck is John King. Thank you. Yes, I'm Bill Coleman, Newark, Vermont. Um, I'm here to um, discuss uh, the implications of rate hikes, um, particularly. Um, obviously, the Affordable Care Act um, is under fire from uh, corporate interests and um, being uh, mischaracterized by the corporate media, political candidates who attempt to defend um, the continuation of the um, Affordable Care Act are really um, being um, mistreated brutally. Um, just clever choices of words, descriptions, um, the way that things are phrased and described influences the public responses and um, in this way influences the outcomes of elections. But um, when it comes down to it, there are billions and billions of dollars being made off of health care. Um, is this um, a natural situation that there would be like tens and hundreds of billions of dollars being made off of health care, pharmaceuticals, and the close alliances and interlocking boards of directors from all these companies? Or is this just something that's um, being permitted to take place because of corporate dominance of government that's already been taking place for a long time? I contend that this is a very unnatural situation and that uh, the rate hikes being requested at this point by um, Blue Cross Blue Shield are um, an effort to really drive a wedge between middle income wage earners and those who are currently receiving uh, Medicare 
um, people receiving Green Mountain Care and things of that nature. Um, they know that they can really fuel resentments. The higher the rates go, the more the middle income workers who are forced to pay these very high rates are going to resent the heck out of people who are low income people um, receiving Medicare for free. So do they really not have an intense, um, intensely obvious conflict of interest um, in any information that they provide? And how closely is this information really able to be scrutinized? They come up with it, they, they bring it forward to the board, and um, their word is probably taken to be um, fairly honest and accurate. Um, we've got a federal government that um, believes that industries are pretty much capable of self-regulating. So the problems come from the top down. We've got 80,000 toxins that have been permitted onto the market by, um, by manufacturers of um, all sorts of petrochemicals and um, herbicides, pesticides, and things of this nature. And they're right at the root of cancer that people are getting. Cancer problems end up in the healthcare system, and we're ending up with people who are, so it's an unregulated chemical industry that's polluting the air, polluting the water, ending up polluting people's bodies, and then they end up in our healthcare system having to pay, you know, if they randomly become a victim of um, PCBs or of um, PFOAs or of, um, glyphosate poisoning, they're here in the healthcare system because it, the system wasn't regulated previously by the um, Department of Agriculture, the FDA, or whatever regulatory bodies there were. But at, this, at your decision making level, when it comes to the insurance, we really have to think about this deliberate likelihood of the conflict of interest of this driving a wedge between the middle income workers and those receiving the benefits of Green Mountain Care. Can we permit it to just go higher and higher? Is this really anything resembling an ethical system that would normalize the idea of profits being made at this level and a class of people who can just live such extravagant lifestyles while there is such an increasingly bad level of suffering taking place on the part of an increasingly large population that the wealthy people in this country never see? The, the, pop, the populations of wealthy people live in economically segregated communities. Sometimes they're in gated communities around this country. They have little or no contact with people of low income who are suffering the most under this system. They go to country clubs, they know pe other country club members. Or, um, they, the places where they go, the restaurants they go to, are places where economic elites are congregating. But we have an increasingly suffering population that aren't able to even articulate for themselves the extent of their suffering. And it's all because of profits being permitted to take place in an unregulated economic system in a really grotesque manner. So it's time to really put a stop to this game that's being played and to severely question the credibility of any request for further rate hikes from this for-profit healthcare system. Beyond that, we need to really um, think about what the implications are, if this is going to continue to go on in a runaway fashion, is this not going to destabilize the entire um, country at the rate it's going, with the economic inequality, the two people's deteriorating health, and we know that the population is, for the first time, dying at a younger and younger age. For years, longevity had been increasing in this country. That's no longer the case. People are dying now at, at younger ages, and it's very likely to continue without some sort of checks and accountability being brought to the corporations that are increasingly dominating the government and manipulating the outcomes of every conceivable decision-making board that could possibly exist to try and put the brakes on to the greed and the corruption that is permeating the entire system. Thank you, Bill. Next is John King, and on deck is Paula Schramm. Is John King here? Okay. Then we'll go to Paula Schramm, and on deck will be Walter Carpenter. Uh, 
I'm Paula Schramm. I'm from Enosburg Falls. Um, I'm here to uh, read a letter from my friend, Carolyn Brons, also from Enosburg, uh, who wasn't able to be here. She's writing on behalf of her sister, who is, uh, she wrote this up for her sister. Her sister's currently involved in the midst of something. She's recovering from surgery. So Carolyn uh, wrote about uh, her case. I am writing on behalf of my sister, who is recovering from a serious surgery. She is a respiratory therapist at a local hospital and has a BCBS gold plan. Here is her story. I saw a doctor on April 30th for unexplained abdominal pain. He ordered a CT scan, with and without contrast, which needed a blood draw to check for kidney function. The CT scan was scheduled, but was denied as not medically necessary on May 10th. The doc had to have a face-to-face -face talk with the company that Blue Cross Blue Shield has hired as a watchdog, uh, AIM Specialty Health. The doc told me it was difficult to get this done as they were not available to him when he called, but it eventually was allowed, and I had the CT scan done on June 4th. I had to have a repeat blood draw for the kidney function before the scan. The scan revealed a something, mass or lesion, on my rib, and my doc ordered the MRI and tried to get me in to see the cardiothoracic surgeon. The surgeon wanted the MRI done before he saw me. <coughs> on June 14th, I received the first denial from Blue Cross Blue Shield for the MRI. The reason? The doc couldn't identify it as cancer. However, of course, <laughs> he, uh, it couldn't be identified as cancer until the MRI was done. Quite a catch-22. We kept trying to get the scan approved. It was a frustrating series of many phone calls, paperwork, mistakes made by the Blue Cross Blue Shield reps, papers misfiled, lost. Then the MRI was denied a second time on June 21st. I called Blue Cross Blue Shield on the June 25th to file a grievance and talked to my personnel department on June 28th. My personal personnel department emailed them and we were both stonewalled. So Carolyn continues. Finally, my sister's PC, private, uh, uh, PC physician went out of the box and contacted the surgeon and showed the CT scan to him. The surgeon stepped in to require an immediate MRI to be done, and the next day she had it. Reviewing the scan, the surgeon scheduled surgery as soon as possible, which happened Wednesday on July 17th. Remember, this all started in April. Uh, we are waiting for biopsy results and next steps for this rare condition with uncertain prognosis. If the scan had been done in April as it should have been, if Blue Cross Blue Shield had approved the doctor's order in a timely fashion rather than stonewalling and, out obstruct and obstructing. We don't know what the outcome of the situation will be, but it is outrageous that she had to wait to spend hours fighting and advocating along with others on her medical team only to be blocked time and again. We vehemently oppose a rake hike for this insurance company until they undergo a thorough review of exactly what is their mission. What is their protocol for working with the medical professionals who know what their patients need? Why are they hiring another company as a watchdog? Why do they deny a scan that not only could save a life, but also save money by being done in time so that a condition does not get worse by waiting? Carolyn ends by saying, this system is broken. Do not put more money into it without an overhaul. Thank you, Paula, and please pass on our thanks to Carolyn as well. Walter, and on deck is Karen Saunders. Testing. The I'll try to be brief, which is probably refreshing for the board members who know me, who are cursed to know me. But one of the, th I had a testimonial written, but I'm gonna discard that because I've been listening to the hearings and the common theme here seems to be the timelessness. 
The first time I went to a public hearing was in 2009, after I had had to bargain for the price of my own life. <coughs> the insurance company was not Blue Cross Blue Shield. The CEO of that insurance company made $13 million that year. Now it probably would be $50 million, $60 million for one CEO. The CEOs of Blue Cross and MVP are all in the six and seven figure salaries. They have lavish benefits. They have nice retirements. If I remember right, one was sent off into retirement with $7.25 million. We subsidize these companies to the tune of millions of dollars every month premiums, taxes, Medicare Advantage plans, all the rest of them. We're being double taxed too because we pay the state taxes for Blue Cross Blue Shield because they are not paying state taxes because they are a nonprofit. I do not know if that's true for MVP, but I'm certain that is probably the same or a similar story. We also pay for the lobbying efforts that they use at the state house in to keep single payer at bay and to keep health care costs very high. I think it's time to think about that and to think about the ultimate question is, is whether or not we really need these insurance companies to do something that we could do ourselves just as easily. We already do it because over 50% of our population is insured either Medicare, Medicaid, VA or some form of public <coughs> health insurance. So why do we need the other 50% of that? They consume a vast amount of our health care resources. And a rate like this, a rate increase like this, is pretty outlandish, although typical. I remember last year we were at a hearing, what was it, 10 point something or other? And next year we're going to be here again. The excuses will be the same. You know, pharma costs are higher, our reserves are low. We need to supplement our reserves. The actuaries say that our costs are too, the patients need more health care than we thought. You know, on and on and on. The year after that, we're going to be for another rate hearing. The year after that, I've been at these hearings for 10 years. I'll probably be at them for another 10 years. The question that's laying underneath all of this is do we really need these companies? The answer is no we could do it ourselves just as easily. We don't need to pay millions of dollars every month to subsidize CEO salaries and to subsidize taxes that we pay for in addition to premiums, deductibles, co-pays, and all the rest of it. Amen. The last raise I got was 50 cents an hour. I'm 63, I work in Vermont's tourist business, which brought in 2.8 billion last year and paid 3.90 million in state taxes. The last raise I got was 50 cents an hour and that was begrudging. Out of that, I have to subsidize 11% for MVP and 15% for Blue Cross Blue Shield, whether I'm an insured person or not. Every Vermonter all 630,000 of us are paying for these two companies in some way or another. And it's time to assess what we are paying for. We're going to hear these stories again next year and the year after that, because that's what we're getting for all that money that we're subsidizing them by. Thank you very much for holding the hearing. Thank you, Walter. So next up is Karen Saunders, and on deck is Amy Lester. Hi. I'm Karen Saunders. I live in Brattleboro. I spent many years as a teacher, and when you're a teacher, you have this huge extended family, and it's their story that I'm here to tell you about. You know, the 10 and 11-year-olds that I spent a lot of years with generally had good health care because we have Dr. Dinosaur here in Vermont, right? And that was great. But often their parents didn't have good health care. And all of you adults in the room know that you worry about your kids. What you might not know is that your kids worry about you. And when your kids worry about you, they're not learning very well. Um, funny thing what anxiety does. 
so I would call parents and say, what's up? Your child's having a hard time all of a sudden. Oh, well, I've been really sick. I can't afford to go to the doctor, and I know she's worrying about me, or I know he's worrying about me. Or more than once, and at parent-teacher conferences, I would hear this, the insurance rate hikes. We had to drop our health insurance, and now I can't keep going to the doctor. So I recently read that in the last five years, the cumulative rate hikes for Blue Cross Blue Shield here amounted to 40%, a 40% rate hike. Can you imagine a 40% raise in your pay? Most of us can't imagine it. And those parents never got it. So it isn't working. As person after person before said, this is a broken system. It would be so wonderful to come back here. I know you've been hearing about coming back here and saying the same story year after year. It would be so cool if we could come back here and say thank you for working with us and using your oversight and regulatory abilities to make sure that our universal publicly funded healthcare system is working for us the way we intended it to and that the financial plan is and we've got a good one. We've got more than one good financial plan that's been submitted over the years. Make, and that that's been working. Imagine all of these people coming here and saying thank you. That's what we hope to do in a couple of years instead of continuing these stories. Thank you, Karen. Amy Lester and then Jim Percher. Thank you for listening to us tonight. Good afternoon, good a evening, almost. My name is Amy Lester. I'm a mother, a small business owner in central Vermont, and a member of the Vermont Worker Center. I'm currently a Medicaid recipient with the strong likelihood I'll earn more next quarter and will no longer qualify for Medicaid and will be turning to Vermont Health Connect for health insurance through a private provider. A rate hike increase will destroy any chance of expanding my business to provide employment to central Vermonters and will most likely provide me with a less take-home income. There is there's also a possibility I may choose to be uninsured, which is a risk this 52-year-old may have to take. I applaud your courage to stand up to the health insurance lobbyist and ask that you look at a 0% increase. I hope there comes a time when these hearings are focused on what's best for Vermonters, all Vermonters, not insurance and hospital executives. When Act 48 is financed and all Vermonters have access to quality, affordable health insurance that is uncoupled from their work and jobs, these hearings will be looking at fine-tuning health care for Vermonters. That's what this board is supposed to be doing not increasing rates that surely go to a very few. Imagine a world where everyone in this room had access to health care. Then Vermont would truly be one of the greatest states in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Jim Percher and then Anders Ogney. Well, I wonder what, uh, uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Can you hear me now? I don't want to be too loud. Uh, I wonder what the uh, Green Mountain Care Board could do to impress upon the legislature and what other powers that be. Obviously, we're here complaining about a rate hike by Blue Cross Blue Shield of 15%. What could you also do about putting a rate hike cap on Blue Cross and Blue Shield? In light of the testimonies given today, it's obvious that they are super wealthy, super powerful, and they don't need one more dollar from us. I'd say a 20-year cap 
on a rate hike for Blue Cross Blue Shield would be a good start. If it works out to the benefit of the insured, then let's go for 50 years. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Andrew Zogny and then Aaron Lamontagne. Uh, my name is Anders Augie, and I live in Northfield. Um, I currently have health insurance through MVP, and before that, I had a policy with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, a year and a half ago, um, I was hired for a new position within my company, um, although really I just got more hours there. I went from part-time to full-time, and I should be there right now, by the way, but I'm not. I'm here instead. Um, and that, that pay increase uh, that came with that made me ineligible for Medicaid. Uh, since that company doesn't he offer health insurance benefits, and I don't see how they could with what they bring in, um, I bought a plan on an exchange. Um, I haven't been to a doctor once since buying insurance through the exchange. Um, part of that is the co-pays are a barrier, and also I'm scared. Um, a few months ago, a friend shared a, her story with me and her situation completely encapsulates my anxiety about health care and health insurance. Uh, she works part-time on a farm while she's parenting, um, and her partner works full-time. At, uh, at the beginning of the season, she got a doctor's bill that equaled what she was going to make for the summer, like her total take-home pay. Um, it wasn't an emergency or a crisis. She was just getting something like a problem checked out. Um, how hopeless and scary is that? I feel really scared that something similar will happen to me. Um, with blue, both MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield, I chose a bronze plan because it was a monthly premium that, w because the monthly premium was something I could pay. After bills, food, and gas, I have about $300 left over in a month. Um, that's not nothing, but also, I'm not in a place where I can give up a third of my discretionary income for a silver or gold plan. Um, I think I'd be much better off to save that. Um, and I know that I'll go, with a bronze plan, I know that I'll go into thousands of dollars of, of debt to meet my deductible if I ever have a medical event or need to start seeing a doctor regularly. Um, that's where my fear in seeing a doctor lies. And besides the deductible, I know that I'll need to pay co-pays every time. But what other option do I have? I could go with a lower deductible plan that would eat up all my extra money um, in the premium, and that's not a solution. I don't understand how MVP or Blue Cross Blue Shield could be asking for another rate hike. My wages won't go up 15.6% or 11% in the next year. I'll be lucky to get 2%. Uh, the cost of inflation, um, and I'm already struggling. In April, I overdrafted while paying my premium, and that was embarrassing and upsetting. Not long before that, I got my tax return back, and it was a fifth of what I expected. I had um, miscalculated when signing up for the exchange how much money I would make in the year, and nearly all of my tax refund was taken back to repay the insurance subsidies that I received over the, pa the previous year. So I make too much for Medicaid, and I can't afford the premium on decent health insurance, even with as assistance. I'm shelling out money every month for health insurance that provides me zero sec security. My story and that of my friend that I mentioned are not unique. I can name dozens of people that I, I know are in similar spots. It's wrong that p paying premiums causes us financial stress, and it's wrong that when we need health care, we can't afford to use insurance or pay our deductibles. Um, and I wonder what Green Mountain Care Board is going to do in response to this affordability crisis. Um, I ask that you do not raise rates, and also I wonder what else you can do. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. Uh, next is Aaron Lamontagne, and on deck is Christina Pasnick. Boy, I really butchered that name, huh? Is it Eric? Well, you actually got the last name pretty close, but the first name is Eric. Okay. Usually it's the other way around, but well done. Um, 
Uh, so good afternoon. My name is Eric Lamontagne. Uh, I'm a 32-year Vermonter, a resident of South Burlington, and um, the, ex the executive director at Campaign for Vermont. Um, thank you for the opportunity for coming here, for letting us to come here and make these comments. Thank you to you, you folks who came up and usually I'm loud enough. Thank you to you folks who came up and shared so many amazing, touching personal stories. It was really uh, impressive to see the bravery that was demonstrated here tonight. I'm going to speak to something a little bit differently. Uh, I'm going to speak to the core of transparency and accountability. Blue Cross and Blue Shield, MVP, they're here, they're asking us for more money. They're asking to take more money out of the pockets of hardworking Vermonters. This is not something that should be supported at this time. Nothing has led us to believe that the accountability and the transparency exists so that we as Vermonters can have confidence that our best interests are being held in mind, that our money is being well spent, and that all is being done to mitigate the need for future increases. So to that extent, we pose the following questions. What has, been, what has been done to hold the medical institutions accountable for the upward pressure on insurance premiums? What is being done to mitigate the need for these annual increases and have other avenues been explored? What do we get for our extra money? How does this cost increase improve the health of Vermonters? What or who should we look to so that we can trust that our money is being used responsibly. And finally, are these increases absolutely necessary for the continued well-being for the state? And if so, in direct terms, why? And what are the consequences for not implementing these increases? These are questions that must be answered before Vermont is asked to shoulder yet another financial burden. I'm willing to bet that very few people in here saw their income increase 15% or 11%, the amount that we are at being asked to increase our monthly spending. This is real money impacting real people in real ways. It is going to force real Vermonters to make real decisions. People are going to have to make real sacrifices as to where and how they allocate their limited financial income limited financial resources. This is what is being asked of us. So far, neither transparency nor accountability to all Vermonters has been demonstrated whatsoever. Until that is done, this rate increase must not go forward. Thank you, Eric. Next is Christina Pasnick, and on deck is Rachel Desolitz. I'm here on behalf of the National Association of Social Workers, Vermont Chapter, and I'm speaking out of concern for my clients and their families, my colleagues, and also for myself and my own family. I don't think I need to say much about the urgent need for affordable and accessible care for all people in our state and the unnecessary, tedious, and exhausting process of jumping through hoops while you're sick just to get your medical treatment covered. I don't need to say much about the greed of insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies in the U.S or the imperative need for a universal health care system because I think others here have outlined that very nicely today and I thank you for that. Uh, I am a recipient of Blue Cross Blue Shield and I have chronic autoimmune disease so I've personally experienced um, previous rate increases. Many other social workers and mental health providers in our state are also Blue Cross Blue Shield recipients. Our work is very rewarding but can also be very challenging. And in our daily work, we do our very best to provide care and support for others. And we deserve to be able to access affordable care when we need it to. Um, the average social worker in Vermont is making 9% less than what the national average is. And it's about the same for other mental health providers. Um, between what I pay and what my employer pays for my medical coverage, not including dental and a less than stellar vision plan, my medical insurance costs more than 25% of what I what I actually make. Um, I'm not getting an 8 to 10% raise this year. My colleagues aren't getting an 8 to 10% raise this year. And my clients are certainly not getting that raise either. With the rising cost of living, student loan debt, and fairly low pay when compared to the national average, 
we all most certainly cannot afford the rising health care costs that are being proposed. So please say no to these rate increases. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Rachel Desolet, and on deck is Karen Hart. I hadn't planned to talk today because I'm on Medicare, um, which I have paid for throughout my, all of my working years. They say I'm elderly. I thought I had it made. Foolish me. I paid into Medicare. I thought I'd be covered. I thought I'd be all set. I worked as a social worker in the nonprofit field most of my life. I retired at 68, not 62, with no pension, living on Social Security, and qualified for VHAP with Social Security income. When I turned 70 and a half, I no longer qualified for VHAP. I spent four months, lots of time, every single week, examining different policies, scrutinizing vocabulary. No one uses the same vocabulary. They all mean the same, different things, so that I could compare apples to apples. I decided to go with Blue Cross Blue Shield. I took a chance, because the information I was receiving was inconsistent from one navigator to another. My premiums from VHAP to Blue Cross and Blue Shield increased five times, equivalent to 25% of my Social Security income. And we all know that Social Security falls short in meeting any monthly expenses. In addition, even though I have coverage, I continue to gather information from insurance providers trying to understand why the insurance is not covering expenses, which is the most frustrating thing. <laughs> Lastly, I am not looking forward to October when I will have to once again research the different insurance options and what they offer and what it will cost. Hopefully, the language, the jargon, won't change. Not how I envision spending my retirement time. Thank you, Rachel. Next up is Karen Hart. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Hart, and uh, this is my first time at a hearing like this, and I'm a little bit nervous, so I'm going to do my best. Um, I'm here not to talk about a personal struggle, even though I could as someone who has a 10-year-long chronic illness. Um, I'm here because I represent uh, an animal hospital here. Uh, this is a small business in Vermont that employs 29 employees, um, and we are very busy, and we are barely able to afford our costs as it is. Um, I'm here to speak what it's like to run a small business and also what it's like to be a hospital. Um, an animal care hospital is very different from a human care hospital. There are a lot of differences involved. Uh, that being said, I know what it's like to deal with the rising costs. I know what it's like to deal with the rising costs of medication, of drugs that you need for your patients. Every time we get a new order in, it seems we have something that's gone up in price. And sometimes it's by as much as five or $10 a CC for a drug that you need to use multiple CCs of in a patient. Uh, sometimes it's a medication that is doubled in cost. We are lucky in the animal healthcare field because we get a lot of these things secondhand from the human healthcare field. A lot of these things have gone through human healthcare and there's a generic by the time it gets to us. But we are still dealing with these rising costs. And I understand that. I understand why Blue Cross Blue Shield is having these issues and wanting to raise the cost because it is hard. That being said, we do everything in our power to keep our prices to our clients as low as we possibly can because we know how difficult it is to have an animal and not be able to afford the care that they need. Again, I'm sorry, I am nervous. 
And as a small business in Vermont, um, who does employ just under 30 employees, it is very important to me and to the business owner to support our employees. And we, I really, really, really wish we could give everybody a 10% raise, uh, but we cannot afford that. Um, not only can we barely afford the subsidies that we provide for healthcare for our employees, but with a decent amount of subsidizing, we still have employees who can't afford their portion of the health insurance. And these are people who work full time in a field that requires them to be very technically skilled. Um, it's also very important to us to support our community, which is why we do try to keep our prices as reasonable as we possibly can in the face of rising costs, which is why I wonder why this can't be done in the human health care field as well. I think the final point that I would like to make is that with all of these rising costs and with trying our hardest to improve the lives of our employees and of my coworkers, um, and I, am, I know that I am lucky to have the insurance that I do have and to make you know, a whopping $35,000 a year. Um, and again, like I said, I am one of the lucky ones. I still blew through my $5,000 deductible very early on this year with one illness. And I am a otherwise healthy 30 year old. Um, it is very, very important to me and to, the, and to the woman who runs the business with me that we are able to provide for our employees and keep this business local to Vermont. And it gets increasingly difficult every year to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So those are the names that I have. Is there anyone else who has not spoken? Yes, come right up front. And I did butcher one name real bad, so if it's yours, I'm really sorry. No, I, I wasn't signed up. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name. Yeah. My name is Ellen Kay. I live in Barrie, and I've also lived in Southern Vermont for about 20 years before that. Um, I spoke with a family member today, who is on a medication that they need to take every single day, and if they don't, they have some withdrawal symptoms. And it's not pleasant. <laughs> it's scary, actually. It can happen pretty quickly. <sighs> the um, pharmacy that she went to said she has to have these um, pills in two different, uh, I don't know all the technical words, right? But she has like this many milligrams in this bottle and this many in the other and is supposed to take them in combination. Well, the insurance company said she can only have a 30-day supply of one of the sizes and a 90 of the other. So what she's doing now, and a pharmacist gave her this advice because this has happened before, is that she's taking a different amount on the two days to even it out. Right? I mean, I, she told me this today on my way to this hearing. This is, this is, to me, a company and a whole industry that is only about profit. It's not about health care. It's a good way to make a lot of money. And if they could do it selling widgets, they would have been doing that. But they're not. They're exploiting our need for health. So that insurance company, who doesn't give a damn about people's health, can intervene and say, no, no, she can't have that supply of pills. Where's the morality here? They are only making money off of us, that's all. And I just want to point out something that is glaringly obvious here. Have any citizens stood up and defended the rate hike? <laughs> no? What a surprise. This is really unbalanced. I th in my opinion, that is all you need to see. All you need to understand is that one side is doing something for profit, and the entire rest of the state, I would imagine, opposes it. And we're the people who live here. So are you going to intervene on our behalf, or are you going to help these insurers make more profit out of the people who live here? That is what I'm going to leave you with. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Was it, would anybody else wish to speak? 
So as you can see, come, on, come forward. And as she's coming forward, I just want to say that, as you can see, healthcare is a very emotional, it's a very personal thing. It affects us all. And uh, I really uh, am so thankful to everyone here for being so respectful to each of the speakers. So thank you. My name's Rose Brand, and I live in Barrie. I help out with my church's soup kitchen. And I see a lot of poor and poor and homeless people, and some people are trying to get jobs. And a lot of the jobs are part-time jobs, like McDonald's and stuff. And I think of people that don't make a lot of money, and I see a lot of children. And I think of a 15% rate hike, and I think if that comes out of their pay, is that somebody's children are not going to get vegetables or, or nutritious food while they're trying to pay the insurance at the rate hike? Or is it somebody's car's not going to get fixed and they can't get to work? Because it's a lot of money. And they'll pay the insurance and it, it'll come out of somewhere else and maybe they won't get to keep their job because they paid the insurance and then they'll lose the insurance anyway. And the, they'll go back on Medicaid. I don't know. I just think it's a lot of money where they might have kept their insurance if it wasn't so high and kept their job. and Because the, a lot of kids, when they go to school, they don't eat the vegetables because if they don't have it at home, they're not going to eat it at school. Uh, maybe they're eating vegetables now or good food and the increase in insurance, they won't get the good food. So a lot of people shop at the dollar store for food. Thank you, Rose. Hi, my name is Britta Fisher. Um, last year I told my story and reminded you that this is a moral decision. And I didn't think that I was going to get up and make a statement tonight. Um, but I felt like I couldn't let the hearing end without drawing attention to the irony of the behavior by our own facilitator tonight. Um, earlier, we heard commentary from someone who has a chronic illness and cannot afford the care she needs. And the suggestion. Um, was to direct her to the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, I actually work at Vermont Legal Aid, um, which is where the HCA is housed, um, and can personally attest at how helpful they are and what great individuals they are. Um, however, I see a pretty large blind spot that's necessary for someone on this board specifically created to transition to universal health care and to help Hold, and to help the public hold insurance companies accountable um, to suggest the, AC, the HCA as an avenue to navigating a broken system that it has taken the responsibility to help us fix. It is the job of this board to facilitate a transition to a system where people like the person who spoke earlier can afford health care. Since that is not what you are working on, the one area where we can ask you to help is in with the insurance premiums. By allowing rate increases, you are turning your backs on us. Prioritize, choosing to prioritize the profits of Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP over the ability of people in Vermont to pay for the services they need to keep themselves healthy. If you think the heartbreaking story we heard earlier of the person who had to fight with Blue Cross Blue Shield to cover her miscarriage, the care her miscarriage required, and the other stories that we've heard tonight are not related to the insurance premium, think I encourage you to think about it again. First, using that example, if she had been able to afford the monthly premiums, maybe, maybe you could argue that it was ethical to allow, to 
try to make her pay out of pocket for those services despite having insurance, though I would argue against that. Second, as you approve the rate hikes, you need to know that while the insurance companies are convincing you that rate hikes are necessary to providing care, if that's an argument that you choose to believe, then I hope you listened as person after person told stories of their own fights to get care approved by those same companies. Um, sorry, nonprofits. Um, who let down people at their most vulnerable every day. The goal of the private um, health insurance companies is to maximize profits. Earlier, Mr. Mullen, you attested that there were no bonuses for denying care. However, if there are incentives to save money for the company, and money can only be saved by denying coverage, then I would argue that there are incentives for denying care. I am testifying not to ask you to fix this broken system alone. In fact, I think there are many of us in this room who are eager to do that work with you. And I resent the commentary at the beginning of asking us for civility. I am angry. I am upset. People are dying. Just because we are in a city hall removed from the sites of care where that is happening doesn't mean we can forget about the real world impact. While the testimony from the insurance companies has to do with their increased po po profits, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, the people impacted by the decisions you make have to stand up and tell their most intimate and their most devastating stories in the hopes that they'll be able to make you care enough to make a decision in our favor. What I'm asking you to remember is that every percent increase you agree to you are affirmatively and actively sending the message that people in Vermont deserve to have to make the choice between food and care or housing and care. You are supporting the increasing profits of a company that prevents people from accessing life-saving care. You are supporting them as they deny care to people who have had miscarriages, who have chronic illnesses, and who are fighting for their lives. And I hope you remember all of our faces as you make that choice. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Yes, come, come forward. Hi, my name is Priscilla Relier, and I am from Barry. I'd like to ask the Green Mountain Care Board a question. I have a chronic illness. If you raise the rates of health care, what is a senior citizen as well as myself to do? I am a diabetic, type 2. With the rising costs of insulin, we have to decide, do we pay for our health care or do we go without our essential medication? And I thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Is there anyone else? If not, I want to thank you very much for coming out. You know, it's, it's uh, really good to put the human face behind health care. Um, I can tell you that um, this board tries very hard every day to make the right decisions. Um, sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't, um, but we continue to try. Thank you. She yes? Has, she asked a question of the board, and at least, if you're not going to answer it, at least say you can't answer that at this time. But some response. Do you want to try, Rob? Sure. Uh, so these insurance rates that we're currently considering don't impact uh, Medicare or Medicaid, so I would need to know more about her insurance to know specifically how it would impact her, and I'm happy to speak with her afterwards. Uh, so it, it, it depends. Like, this is a very limited rate filing, um, but hopefully if she's on Medicare or Medicaid, then this specific filing shouldn't impact her.
And unfortunately, the lines get blurred in healthcare, and I know that uh, um, there are many passionate stories. What we're dealing with in this decision-making process strictly relates to the exchange product. Um, so it doesn't affect Medicaid or Medicare or um, insurance that um, is part of a self-insurance program or a large group program. This is the individual market and the small group market. But it's important to hear everyone's stories anyways because we're all in this together and everyone should be able to seek care in Vermont and know that they're getting quality care and that they'll never be turned away. So are you saying that I'm on Medicare and I have Blue Cross and Blue Shield as a supplemental, but that 15% increase, if it goes through, will not So that's a, that's a different product? Yes. It won't impact you because Medicare you. supplemental, we actually don't review. That's reviewed by the Department of Financial Regulation, this, so this, this should not This is strictly you. the individual and small group okay. plans through the exchange. So the, there are a number of factors that have caused them to um, not be able to break even. There, the, there's a trend on prescription drugs, especially on specialty drugs. These are drugs that can really help someone, especially someone with cancer or leukemia, um, but they're very, very expensive. And that trend alone is, is about half of what they have requested in their rates and there's a number of other things it's utilization it it um, there are a lot of strong actuarial arguments that they have posed and what the board must do now is try to figure out a way to put what is our statutory charge because we have to follow the law as well so we have to make decisions to make sure these rates um, not only um, are trying to protect the consumer, but we also have to make a decision that would not allow um, the insurance company to go insolvent, because we certainly would not want our only Vermont insurance company to be out of business. I think they should, because they, because they raise their rates too much. Except who would be left to provide the coverage? But unfortunately, this board cannot put in place universal health care. That would have to be a legislative decision approved by the governor. Well, the governor, the governor don't want to do anything except put two million dollars on the on the state house and go run his car instead of trying to help all the poor people and everybody with universal health care. So it's actually on him. But you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield. The, the, the medicine that you're talking about, some people who have that, some of their medicines are four, five hundred dollars that comes out of their own pocket. And who, and what is Blue Cross Blue Show for? 20%? Come on. My mom used to work for Blue Cross Blue Show, I know how it is. I'm not dumb. She's not done. She she she's right now sitting in a in a rehab. She's got maybe two months to two years to live. Me and you had talks. Yep. Before. Yep. I'm 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 not very happy. I'm very angry because all Blue Cross Blue Shield wants is money, 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 money. And I know probably the CEO sitting in here. If he is, he gets it put in his pocket and goes sits on his little boat. People can laugh. Nobody's laughing. No one's laughing, I just heard. But it's okay. I say I say what I feel like I say. If no one likes what I say, you know, you're the door. Yep. Thank you for that. <coughs> Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>